All financial advice provided on this show is for entertainment and educational purposes only. The financial ideas and strategies discussed are only provided as a starting point for a conversation about money matters. With regard to your particular investments and financial strategies, consult your financial planner, CPA, or investment professional. All your financial decisions are yours and yours alone to make and subsequently are solely your responsibility. The information that is supplied through the context of the radio program and any repurposing of its content by the host or network is a combination and collection of solid financial investment understanding, opinion, and comments. This network, show, and its host are not liable for financial strategies, outcomes that you employ in any manner that result in any kind of loss. Shares of corporate sponsors may be the subject of buy or sell recommendations in Jay Taylor's newsletter in accordance with Jay's objective opinion. Welcome to Turning Hard Times and Good Times. I'm your host, Jay Taylor. I'm speaking to you from the borough of Queens in New York City. It is the 12th day of April, 2023. I'd like to uh, just make a note that I do publish a newsletter called Jay Taylor's Gold Energy and Tech Stocks. And I believe these are very exciting times for this sector of uh, gold and silver uh, exploration companies, uh, given the price of gold has now exceeded uh, $2,000 and silver has recently catapulted above $25 an ounce. So uh, things are really looking up for the uh, for the precious metal sector, I believe, and now more than any time uh, in recent past, I think is the time to buy and to look into at least explore these exploration companies. Uh, very great uh, stories that I'm covering in my newsletter and I will be telling you about one of them. Um, well, we'll let our guests tell us about one of the companies that I've recently just started covering uh, in my newsletter. Um, also like to encourage you to send along any questions, uh, comments that you might have about this show uh, to questions for taylor at gmail.com. Questions the number four, taylor at gmail.com. Uh, my guests today, Alistair McLeod and Michael Hopley. Michael is the president and CEO of Alpha Explorations. That's a company that I began covering in my newsletter that's just this last week. Uh, I've titled today's show, Triffin's Dollar is Crashing. In the 1960s, an economist, Belgian and American economist, Robert Triffin wrote about how a fiat reserve currency could lead to national wealth. You could create endless amounts of money from thin air, but it required one thing. It required that a nation would uh, exercise and uh, make sure that they ran major chronic trade deficits year after year that was necessary so that there would be sufficient liquidity in the global economy to allow the dollar or whatever currency was used to become uh, the world's reserve currency. And so we did. Uh, after Nixon took us off the gold standard in 1971, um, it seemed to work very well. Uh, for quite a few decades now, the U.S. could print money out of thin air and use that money to buy up uh, goods and services, well, mostly goods uh, created in China and other countries that had net exports, and we had net deficits, uh, net trade deficits. Uh, and so we uh, have now come to the time when that, uh, that may not work so well anymore, as many different countries are looking to uh, get out of the dollar for various reasons. Alistair McLeod will be with me to explain why the dollar uh, is in decline and how that plays into the favor of gold. Alistair will be with me in the second segment of today's show. But right now, I'm happy to tell you that Michael Hopley, the president and CEO of Alpha Explorations, is with us. Michael is a geologist with more than 40 years of experience. He was the CEO of Sunridge Gold uh, when he guided that company to the discovery of a major VMS deposit, um, a copper, zinc, and gold deposit in Eritrea. Um, but before I say hello to Michael, let me just tell you that Alpha trades in Toronto under the symbol ALEX. Uh, you can buy it in the U.S. under the symbol ALPXF. Uh, and the stock has uh, about 73.7 million shares outstanding. Recently trading in the United States, or trading in U.S. dollars, I should say. It hardly trades in the U.S., but trades actively on Toronto, uh, it, you can buy it in the US. The US dollar equivalent is around 60 cents, giving it a market, giving the company a market cap around $44 million. Welcome, Michael, and thanks for joining me today. Uh, you have three exciting large scale projects in Eritrea, the Aberna, it's an orogenic gold project where you've had some early success, drill results just spectacular 
um, you know, really very spectacular drill results so early in the program. Uh, you have a gold, you have a gold copper porphyry project as well, and also a VMS project in Eritrea. All three of them look like they could be world class uh, targets for sure. Uh, but you've chosen to uh, go with your orogenic project, the uh, the Urbana. Uh, tell us about that. That's your flagship, and uh, why are you putting an emphasis on that? Just give us a story on Urbana. All right. Thank you, Jay. Um, as a junior company, um, uh, we have to be careful with uh, delegating money to projects. Uh, as you know, I think from previous discussions that the, pro the property we have in Eritrea called Kakasha is a very large project. It's uh, over 700 square kilometers. So it's, you know, 30 kilometers north, south and 30 kilometers east, west. It's a huge property. Yeah. And we, we've established uh, 20 different prospects on that ground, having sort of explored it from one corner to the other. And I could go on all day about the different prospects we have uh, established there or found there. Mm -hmm. But as a junior company, we have to decide what's uh, the priority. Right. And the priority has come down to uh, a burner. It's a gold only project. Um, and, and we think from a junior company point of view, it's the I was going to use the word simple. Simple is not a good word to use in the exploration business. They're all complicated, but um, yeah. uh, this is uh, more simple than some of our other uh, prospects and, and more simple to know where we're going. And as you say, uh, we have some spectacularly good results uh, from, from recent drilling. Should I show you on screen what... Uh, why we think that yeah i think that'd be very helpful if you have some pictures uh they're worth a thousand words and uh go ahead so i guess some editing will be required here but uh yeah no doubt about it but go okay. ahead so um about a burner um i wanted to give you um some sense of of why we're so excited about a burner um this is a, a map of, of the Aberna area. Those black dots are 100 meter uh, squares where we took so soil samples. Soil sampling, soil geochemistry is an early way of exploring for these gold deposits. And this slide is showing that we've got this anomalous gold stretching for 7.2 kilometers uh, in a northeast, yeah. southwest direction uh, and two kilometers wide. So an enormous area. And mm -hmm. what we have done to follow up on that soil sampling is to trench and uh, channel sampling. Uh, trench sampling uh, where we have to dig with a, uh, with a backhoe down about a meter to get to bedrock. Uh, channel sampling where we have essentially, we're at bedrock and we're taking one, one meter interval samples through there. And you can see from this slide that we've got some really spectacular numbers just from taking rock chip samples at the surface. Uh, 45 meters of 3.7 grams per ton, uh, 51 meters of 2.14 grams per ton, et cetera, et cetera. I yeah. won't go through all of them, but you can see this was a way of taking a very large area and beginning to concentrate, focus on where we should be drilling. Mm -hmm. The chemistry was one of it. Then the trench sampling and, and uh, channel sampling was the next step. And this gave us actual targets to start drilling on. And, and, this now turning to the early draw holes. Remember, we have only got results from 43 draw holes over this very large area at the mm -hmm. moment. And you will see that we've got some spectacular results from this early drilling, particularly at this area called Hill 52. Again, we've, we've now focused on these four areas, Hill 52, and I won't go through every one, but 20 meters is 7.7 .7 grams per ton. 50 meters of almost six grams per ton, 80 meters of five and a half grams per ton. So some very spectacular results, even though we've only drilled 43 yeah. uh, drill holes through there. Yeah. We actually started um, a, a third round of drilling mm, three, four weeks ago. So we've got another 2,500 meters of drilling already into a burner, uh, although we don't have results of that yet, but we expect to have that later on this month. Oh, good. So a very large area with some very encouraging draw results. Um, to emphasize the uh, the um, the size, the size potential, I would just like to um, 
show you this. Um, mm -hmm. One of the reasons that we are in the Arabian Nubian Shield that we think is a very undiscovered, uh, un un unexplored area is the size potential. The Sukari deposit is a, an enormous 17 million ton deposit in Egypt. And on, on the same terrain that we're on, the Arabian Nubian Shield and similar geology. And this, I'm not saying that we have another Sukari 17 million ounces, by the way, I'm just giving your view as a sense of scale here, mm -hmm. is the, the, the outline of Sakari, the 17 million ounces, is that purple. So you can fit two or three Sakaris into the area that we're exploring at the moment. Yeah. So that's the reasons that we are very excited about a burner. Yeah, I would think also the fact that you've had so many really encouraging results so early on, it's either, either you got lucky or else you've got an ex enormous system here that you know and you're pinpointing them with your soil samples of course that's right yeah so we we, we started in with the surface sampling and 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 saw some soil sampling and we've got very encouraging results from that and yes i mean I, i've you know got many years decades in the business and when you see something like this this is not an everyday occurrence this no. is uh, you know once or twice in a lifetime this is uh this is these are spectacular results for this early stage mm -hmm. Absolutely. Very exciting. Um, we have other prospects. Um, as I say, this is a big, big property. And I think many junior companies would be uh, happy to have one of these prospects. Absolutely. We've got 20 of them. Uh, in particular, uh, the Aberna Porphyry Gold Copper discovery is, is particularly spectacular. Um, when we first got the property four years ago, four and a half years ago, we covered every square inch of the property in, in soil geochemistry. And as it turns out, one of the advantages of doing that is that we had eight geologists looking through the property, going to every corner and turning over essentially every rock on the property for several months. And they came across things that nobody had documented before. And that's our own Alistair Smith of VP uh, Exploration mm -hmm. on the ground. And um, this is a very spectacular outcrop of green oxide copper that you can walk on for over two kilometers on the ground with some very good copper and gold values um, in, in that, in the, along that whole length of the two kilometers. Um, and then we, our discovery hole, um, drilled three years ago uh had some spectacular results it had 108 meters of 1.24 grams per ton gold and 0.6 percent copper and uh 3.4 3.5 percent uh not percent but grams per ton silver mm -hmm. uh, in which there was a higher grade intersection of over 2.4 grams per ton gold and 1.1 percent copper so very spectacular uh, we've done quite a bit of exploration since and developed a much larger drill target, particularly to the southwest of where those early holes were. And that uh, photograph is Dr. Richard Silito, who we've had on the ground uh, more than once. Um, he is the known expert on porphyry deposits worldwide, and he's given us plenty of direction of where to go next with Anagulu. Yeah. You know, I, I, Michael, it's my understanding that uh, Crescat Capital is an investor in uh, in Alpha, and it's my understanding that Quentin Henning, uh, that he was first attracted to this porphyry uh, deposit, and that's what drew them into it. I, I know he's equally excited about about your orogenic gold uh, discovery as well. But I, I, Quentin was saying, oh, he hopes you really put a deep drill hole down there, swing for the fences, because he thinks this could be a, a home run, I guess. And uh, I just yeah. thought, I just thought I'd mention that that. You know, here was the, the original reason that uh, Crescat got involved, and now you've got another project that's even, you know, maybe a higher priority. But this is this is really something to keep an eye on as well. I think. Yeah, I mean, both Quinton and I share uh, the love of these big porphyry gold copper or copper gold uh, discoveries for a number of different reasons. For a junior company, sometimes he can, these can be challenging because they're big and requires a lot of drilling. Um, but, you know, we, we plan to go after this with another round of drilling uh, later on this year um, and think it has great potential in, in, in addition to a burner. Mm -hmm. 
Indeed, and then you you still have another one that's towards the front of your yeah. And just to, just to mention, yeah, one one other um, the um, in our presentation, which is online, anybody can see, of course. Sure. Uh, uh, Tolagimdra is uh, is our VMS. The the Arabian Union Shield is is known for its uh, VMS volcan volcanogenic massive sulfide deposits, in particular. The Bisha deposit, uh, which was discovered by Nevsan mm -hmm. uh, back about 12 years ago, uh, is a spectacularly good deposit and has become a spectacularly good uh, operation, mining operation for the last several years. And we are just 50 kilometers down the road from that. And the surface part of it looks like you see in the photographs here. We've done very limited drilling, just 10 holes on, on this at the moment. And we've found volcanogenic massive sulfide type, type mineralization in three or four of those holes. Um, but it's one of those projects without going into a lot of detail that we need to uh, draw more on. And with raising the money that we are at the moment, this is another project that we will be drilling in the next few months. Yeah. It's very, very encouraging for sure. And I believe you've had some success with another VMS in the past. In your I have indeed. Yeah. Um, I uh, ran a company called Sunridge Gold for a number of years. Yes. We had a large project in Eritrea called the Esmara Project. And the big success on the Esmara Project was uh, the Embadero VMS, and it's a copper, gold, zinc um, deposit. 80 million tons. And in the VMS world, that's huge. That's a very large deposit. Mm -hmm. We ended up selling the project to a large Chinese company in 2016. And they are currently, I believe, in construction uh, on, on that project. So I have a lot of experience in, in Eritrea, um, along with Alistair Smith, who who's who lives in Esmara, Eritrea, and is the heart and soul of this project from a day-to-day -day technical basis. All right. Well, it's uh, it's good to know you've had some background with one of these uh, one of these types of deposits. Um, anything else you, on the slideshow that you need to show us? Well, I was going to say um, that uh, you know some of the questions some of your viewers might have the question uh, why Eritrea, right? And maybe I could show you a slide here uh, from our presentation mm -hmm. that that just. Is the Arabian Nubian shield in the gray. Okay. Uh, you Prolific. can see the stretches either side of the Red Sea. We think this is one of the few left underexplored terrains in the world. These are shield areas of Canada and Australia uh, are, are huge in terms of mineral deposits. Um, and we think that the Arabian Nubian shield uh, of Northeast Africa and the Arabian Peninsula is very underexplored. As you can see in the slide, Saudi Arabia has the largest area in there, but on the on the west side of the of the shield, Eritrea is almost completely underlain by the the Arabian Nubian shield, and there's a there's a string of successes, both successes exploration successes, but more importantly, successes in bringing them into production mm -hmm. uh, in, in in Eritrea, namely uh, the Nevsan and the Bisha deposit now run by Zenshing. And then the Asmara project um, uh, all around the city of Asmara is now being operated by Sichuan Road and Bridge. And they are, I believe, in construction at the moment after we sold it to them in 2016. Mm -hmm. So as a group, we uh, we have uh, plenty of experience in this neck of the woods. Our, our VP of Advanced Projects, um, Scott McKeague, uh, also was involved in the discovery of, uh, of Jebel here in Sudan. So mm -hmm. that's a that's a copper gold porphyry. So he has plenty of experience in the geology in this neck of the woods as well. Mm -hmm. So as a group, as a team, um, we we are very comfortable operating in Eritrea. I've been through the whole gamut there, from early exploration to negotiations with the government on a joint venture arrangements and so on. Mm -hmm. So uh, as a group, we have plenty of experience there, and we we're very comfortable with it. The rules have not changed in the last few decades, uh, and so uh, we like being there. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, obviously, you know, not only you find the deposits, but uh, you get them into production, and that's really uh, that's really what it's all about. And if, I guess it, what it says to me is that whatever the government is, uh, they're certainly in favor of mining. I imagine it's pretty important to their, to their economy. It's hugely important to the economy, and the, the, the Bisha deposit, 
uh, of which they own 40% is, uh, is, is in production and has been and looks like it will be for many years in the future. Okay, okay well, I, I guess a couple of other questions I just wanted on our burn out your, your uh, orogenic gold uh, deposit, or let's say, I think we can't call it a deposit yet, but it's certainly on its way. Uh, metallurgy. Uh, any any work done there yet on the metallurgy? Uh, actually, not. This is really early in the process. Uh, we are in the process, though, of gathering samples for met for the first round of metallurgical test work. Okay. Our indications are that this, there's going to be no problem because the gold is associated with uh, pyrite, and which is fairly typical for these orogenic gold deposits, and typically that doesn't give uh, the metallurgy, the recovery of the gold, any issues. But we haven't, can't say that definitively uh, this until we have the test done, that'll be done over the next few weeks and months. Mm -hmm. And then with regard to drill plans, have you laid out uh, exactly where you're gonna drill this year uh, uh, is, uh, on, the, um, on your orogenic gold uh, project? Well, um, it, it, it's, a, it's a little bit of a, bit of a dynamic plan, but, but yes, we, we want to draw uh, at least 15,000 meters out of burner that has been subject to uh, financing, whether we do all of that or not. Uh, it looks like we've been successful with the financing, so I think we will do all, if uh, maybe more than that, at, at, at a burner. Um, but yes, we've got maybe, I would say, half of that planned out. And the rest is dynamic because waiting on results. As as we get results in, we switch holes around and move things slightly based on our understanding. Of the yeah, so you have results coming yet. Um, how many drill holes left? Um, well, we've got uh, 43 drilled currently, but there's another, uh, there's another 20, 25 holes in the pipeline at the moment. Uh, that we expect to start getting results from those uh, later on this month. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess that's, uh, I like to sort of round out my discussions with CEOs of these companies asking what drivers, share price potential catalysts might be out there that people should be watching. And I, I guess that we could start with the remaining drill results uh, from last year's program. Uh, and then going forward, I guess it's just watch for drill results. That's exactly right. And uh, we, we have got more um, investor relations type of programs going on and, uh, at the moment, PR programs, because we, we've done a great job, I think, in exploration over the last little month. We have not done a particularly good job in getting the word out there. And a lot of people come across Alpha and say, well, we've never heard of you before, but your results are very spectacular. Yeah. So we want to correct that. But so most of the money we raise have gone into the ground, which is typically what I like being a geologist. Sure. But we are uh, bound to do a much better uh, investor relations program over the next few weeks. And I think we'll have plenty to talk about, too. Well, Michael, that uh, just leads me to remark that you're there are not that many retail shares out there. I think it's pretty tightly held. Uh, the founder of the company did a lot of financing and a lot of a lot of work went into the ground before you went public. Uh, so people that are buying into the shares are buying in now, at a, you know, with a lot of a lot of work already done, a lot of value. I would argue value added given the results that you're having early on with three major potential uh, world class projects. I mean, we don't we don't know yet, obviously, early days, but three very looking uh, projects. Uh, that have the scale and we got to have scale in this business don't we i mean you can't make money on little tiny deposits uh so, right. yeah. yeah then that's why i remarked earlier that i think many junior companies would be happy to have one of our 20 prospects but uh you know we've got uh three that i've mentioned but others i could mention that some of which i think are pretty spectacular uh but as we are raising money, we will move uh, certainly a burn on an Anagulu and others, but maybe other of the prospects will be moved along in time. Well, I have an idea if uh, people start to wake up to your story, your share price is gonna be higher and you're gonna be able to raise money more efficiently and start uh, hitting on some of these other projects as well. Michael, thank you so much uh, for being with us today. It's uh, This is a great story and I'm really glad that you came on my show to talk about it because I think people are going to make a lot of money with this uh, with this story. No guarantees ever in this business, but uh, with gold heading higher and uh, precious metals looking particularly strong right now, I think it bodes very well. So thank you very much, Michael, for being with us. And thank you, Jay. Thank you for the opportunity. You yeah. bet.
Um, well, folks, uh, don't go away because Alistair McLeod is going to be with me in just a moment to talk about why the dollar is in trouble and why that also bodes well for gold. Don't go away. I'll be right back with Alistair McLeod. Welcome back to Turning Hard Times and Good Times. I'm your host, Jay Taylor, and I'm glad to tell you that Alistair McLeod is with me once again. And I, whenever Alistair's on, we'd like to remind you to go to goldmoney.com, goldmoney.com, uh, to the research page, and you'll find uh, a, a, yes, an essay, a very timely essay, usually one that is very, very helpful in understanding why things are going the way they are in the markets. Alistair always writes every Thursday uh, at goldmoney.com. Be sure to go there and catch his articles. Thank you for joining me again, Alistair. That's very much my pleasure, Jay. You know, we uh, titled today's show, Time, well, this is your article, Time to Trash Triffin. Um, April 6th, it appeared at Gold Money. And um, well, as I understand it, Robert Triffin was an economist known for his critique of Bretton Woods, uh, the system, a fixed currency exchange, and he was very much an advocate, I guess, of a, of a floating rate system, which we went to when Nixon took us off the gold standard in 1971. Uh, what, what were his views? Maybe you could just talk a little bit about Triffin's views and to what extent did they play into this system that we've been using since 1971? Well, um, I th first of all, I thought I would take this as an example, if you like, of um, how conventional economic um, thinking doesn't uh, take into account um, the creation of bank credit. Mm -hmm. What Triffin argued was that for the dollar to be a reserve currency, uh, it was necessary for the government and uh, the central bank to run, or, or particularly the government, to run destructive economic policies, yeah. continue to run trade deficits. And, uh, you know, if you didn't get a... Um, uh, a deterioration, as it were, in 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 uh, um, the savings rate, then mm -hmm. uh, that would be matched by excess government spending. So, um, you know, and eventually it would undermine the dollar. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think he he made this point to Congress. I think, without looking at my notes, I think it was in 1960. And then, of course, we had the gold pool, which failed some seven or eight years later. Then we were driven off uh, the Bretton Woods Agreement um, in 1971. Um, and I think we're coming up to another Triffin example, as it were, you know, a crisis uh, which is engendered by the fiscal and monetary policies of the United States. But um, all this is fine. And of course, the assumption is that um, bank credit can't be produced out of thin air. It can be produced out of thin air. So demand for credit, particularly for trade settlement, which is essentially self-extinguishing, because really what you're doing is you're financing um, uh, the acquisition and the transfer of goods across borders. And of course, when uh, they're finally sold or realized in some form or another, the credit disappears. It's, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, it's repaid. So a lot of that is self-extinguishing. Yeah. Um, and really what's happened, uh, and this is where I think the Triffin thing has sort of really gone wrong, is that there hasn't really been the necessity to accumulate massive amounts of dollars in order for the dollar to be used for pricing commodities, for trades, international tra trade settlement, whatever, uh, because bank credit can be expanded to, to, to meet that demand. And as I say, a lot of it is self-extinguishing. So uh, Triffin, I think, um, it, while he had a point, I don't think it was really the whole story. And um, I was prompted to write this because uh, one of um, our more eminent um, uh, economists, a guy called George Magnus, who I think is now got some senior position at Oxford University, <laughs> was writing about the impossibility of the yuan um, becoming, um, you know, replacing the dollar. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, he was sort of effectively echoing what Triffin had said. And, um, you know, I had to take that argument apart. So mm. that's that's how this thing arose. But of course, it raises the question, Jay. I mean, there's so many other 
uh, basic um, uh, beliefs, if I can use that for a, a um, lack of a better word, in, in economics and macroeconomics, which aren't necessarily correct. So, um, you know, I think I might have some fun demolishing some others in the future. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I hope we can still laugh in the future. Things seem to be pretty, pretty bleak in many ways now. I mean, the world is changing so fast, Alistair. I mean, it really is. I mean, so many countries are now suggesting that they're, they're they don't see the need to own dollars anymore. And uh, I mean, just so many of them. Uh, you wrote, and I'd like to quote here, the dollar-based credit bubble is imploding and emerging economies are seeking protection by accepting trade settlements in other currencies, end of quote. Hmm. So maybe you could cite some examples. I mean, I, they're all over the place. It seems like almost every day there's a new country that says, well, we're not so sure that we need to stick with the dollar system. We can, and they're seeing obviously things that are going on in, with China and the, the BRICS, but yeah. maybe you could just talk about some of these examples. Well, I, I think, I mean, the background to it, I think is important to understand. And that is that uh, China and Russia uh, between them um, have corralled into a number of organizations like the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and also BRICS um, for non-Asian uh, participants as well as Asian participants, um, have corralled all these together into uh, what looks like the future economic growth for the planet. Uh, whereas at the same time, we're suffering from contracting bank credit, which is destabilizing our banking and monetary systems. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, these foreign guys are not stupid. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, they may be sitting somewhere in Africa looking at the situation, but they could work it out. And not only that, but uh, they had the advantage of attending um, uh, President Putin's um, St. Petersburg um economic forum back in june last year mm -hmm. where um you know they they were taught the facts of monetary life um you know if you hold dollars dollars or or euros a they're not backed by anything b their purchasing power is sinking faster than any interest you might earn on them and c they might be confiscated from you so you know <laughs> So what we're seeing actually is not just um, a move away from the dollar into something else, whether it's yuan or something else, mm -hmm. uh, but we're also seeing a world which is changing insofar as banks, I think central banks, are not going to hold so much in the way of fiat currency reserves in future. And I think that's an important point. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is something which militates against the dollar mm -hmm. for obvious reasons. Um, as to who's involved in this, well, I think the key point in this was uh, Saudi Arabia and a number of the Gulf Cooperation Organization members who are basically the oil producers around the Gulf and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, what's they, obviously, uh, yeah, they face a future of the West turning around saying, we don't want your fossil fuels. They're going to be banned in Europe from, depending which country, 2030, 2035, 2040, whatever. Um, and, um, OK, they're paying lip service to this uh, in China, India and so on and so forth. But they're not going to do without fossil fuels. They're still building coal fired power stations throughout the continent. Sure. Um, so as far as Saudi Arabia is concerned and also uh, anyone else in, in the fossil fuel game, uh, you, you can forget the West. I mean, they're turning we're turning our backs on them. So where do they go? Well, they definitely go towards China, which sure. is the emerging powerhouse in a world where we've got increased banking risk. I mean, the systemic risks, the possibility that one of our governments, whether it's American or um, Britain, or I don't think it would happen with Britain, but I could actually imagine an American government turning around and saying, uh, we're going to rescue our domestic depositors, but foreign depositors can go hang. I oh. mean, I think it would be the most stupid thing to do, and I'm sure they would be advised against doing it. But, uh, hey, how many times have we seen politicians go against, you know, a sensible policy? So um, I think it's really quite simple. Um, you know, I think they're beginning to go for alternatives. And not only that, the important thing is that there is now safety in numbers. Mm -hmm. In the past, if you wanted to rebel against using the, the dollar, 
then you know you found the CIA on your doorstep organizing this and that rebellion, or alternatively, you find that you know the markets, the financial markets, cut you up very, very rough and destroy your own economy. Right. I mean, this has happened time and time again. But now, of course, the floodgates have opened. So you've got an enormous number of countries which are now looking to take you on. Even President Macron returned from a visit last week mm -hmm. to uh, 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 Beijing. And um, uh, one of the big French manufacturers, uh, I think it's actually an oil exporter, or no, it's, an El it's a liquid uh, natural gas exporter, mm -hmm. is prepared mm -hmm. to accept you on. Wow. Oh, hold on a minute. You know, this is, we're, we're, we're now... Uh, barbarians at the gate, if you like. This so, is, are you talking this is about? A, are you talking about a French exporter here? A French exporter? Yeah, of, a yeah. French uh, exporter uh, of liquid. Well, natural. how will that go over in the European Union? And how will that go over in NATO, Alistair? It's got well, to be. Uh, in, it, 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 like a lead balloon in, in yeah. NATO, right? But um, a dumbfounded silence in the rest of Europe, so far as I can see. Interesting. And the interesting thing about that was uh, it wasn't just Macron uh, visiting, but it was also um, Ursula von der Leyen, the, you know, the the, um, uh, the the president of the European Commission. Right. Now, Macron, who has for a long time um, developed a good relationship with with uh, uh, China, I mean, you know, ev even from the heart of Europe, it's been difficult for him in a sense, was welcomed red car carpet rolled out, you know, big state dinners, the whole thing. Ursula von der Leyen, I think she was met at the air airport by, um, uh, you know, a junior minister. Hmm. And she was sort of shuffled in through the back door, if you like, of this place or that place and was not really involved in any serious meetings. Why? Because uh, previously, I think, um, you know, a few weeks before, she'd make a made a speech about... Um, Taiwan and, uh, you know, how it, it, it uh, should remain as an independent nation. Mm -hmm. You know, this this is not that's that doesn't go down well with the authorities in Beijing. So you can see that, um, you know, this world is getting interesting. And, uh, you know, if we look at uh, the um, people who've attended um, the last BRIC, BRICS meeting, um, it, which was held in last May. I've got a list here of the countries expressing interest. I mean, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, member of NATO, yeah. Egypt, long-standing importer of American arms, Afghanistan. Well, yeah, <laughs> that's said to be interested. You've got Kazakhstan, Nicaragua. This is getting quite close to home here. Absolutely. Nigeria, Senegal, Thailand, and the United Arab, Arab Emirates all had their finance ministers present at the last BRICS meeting. Right. Um, I understand that Mexico, which does a lot of trade in China, <laughs> yeah. is now looking at paying in. On our doorstep, right. Yeah. You've got, well, Brazil is obviously the B in BRICS, yeah. but also right. Argentina. Right. Chile already exports an awful lot to, to China. So you can see that, yeah, the floodgates have opened. And um, I think of the two sides to this story, and this is not being, I think, understood in America. Or not. Uh, for understandable reasons. Um, on the one hand, if you're a foreign foreign government, foreign trader, let's say, you look at not only where you're going to go, but where you're coming from. Mm -hmm. And it's the where that you're coming from, which has changed radically. These rising interest rates have destabilized the banking system. Mm -hmm. We've already seen the Silicon Valley Bank um, fiasco. Uh, and we know there are others in the woodwork. Um, we've seen Credit Suisse fall over, and that had to be rescued. So you're sitting here thinking, do I want to increase my uh, involvement with Western currencies, or do I look for an alternative? And the answer is the alternative actually looks in that basis relatively more attractive today than it did yesterday. And so I think that's something which, you know, which, um, you know, the, 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 the advocates of continuing dollar hegemony, I don't think they really appreciate it. No, I don't. Uh, you know, from, from professors of economics in Oxford University to the man in the street, let's say, yeah. in somewhere in Georgia. Or Paul Krugman, for that matter. In our, on our oh, Paul, yes. <laughs> you well, know, uh, Alistair, wonder, uh, okay, so the case is made that uh, the dollar system is becoming increasingly unstable. 
all right? But what is there on the positive side that might make the system that's being put together by the BRICS, by Russia and China primarily, what would make that more stable then? Why would people be, look, why would all these countries be suddenly looking at, you know, at that and saying, well, gee, maybe this is a better place to go for stability and for trade or whatever. Well, trade, we understand the United States can just cut off any country that doesn't agree with its policies, with its foreign policies. We've seen that in action. That's one reason. But in terms of economic stability, market stability, what would be, what is there about this new system that's being, that's evolving that would make it more attractive, more secure than the US dollar system? Well, there are a number of things. In the very short term, the Chinese economy is really picking up very strongly. Right. So that contrasts with what's going on in the West. Um, if you take Yuan, then you have the opportunity to encash some or all of your balance into physical gold through the Chinese exchanges. Now, you would think that would create a run on gold. Well, yeah, partly, but it's not quite as dramatic as the numbers would suggest, because what we're looking at is a net position. Mm -hmm. I mean, for example, um, Saudi Arabia has come to agreements with China uh, whereby China will um, do a lot of inward investment into uh, um, uh, Saudi Arabia, right. which if you like that, so you've got a capital inflow, which is going to um, counteract the oil exports to a very large degree. So what we're looking at is a balance probably of about two or three billion dollars equivalent uh -huh. in trade between them. Right. Uh, and that balance is in favor of, of, of Saudi Arabia. So uh, Saudi Arabia, I would have thought, would look at it and say, um, OK, we've got a, a better prospects for the currency. That's that's one. Uh, and uh, the second thing is that we could probably hedge 10 percent of our net uh, um, uh, surplus into mm -hmm. gold through the Chinese exchanges. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing then, of course, is what does China do? Does she supply gold from her hidden stockpile yeah. or does she go into, does she allow the market, as, as it were, to to source the gold from outside China, outside Asia even, uh, right. in order to fulfill this demand? I think probably the latter rather than the former. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, I, you know, I think I heard also, Alistair, you, you mentioned that there'd be some you know, trade between China and Saudi Arabia, that China would send some things over to Saudi Arabia. And I saw an article that suggested that uh, China was ready to provide some military hardware to Saudi Arabia. I mean, that's pretty alarming. That has to be alarming to America and to the NATO alliance. And we're because the whole petrodollar was just so strongly attached to Saudi Arabia. I mean, the only thing that made it viable, as I understand it, was Saudi Arabia and OPEC requiring international payments uh, for oil, oil exports in dollars. And that really got it going, didn't it? That allowed the system to be launched. How did the dollar retain value after gold was detached from it? I think that's the answer. And now it's uh, it's being detached from the dollar. That is yes, uh, uh, you're, you're absolutely right, Jay. It's, it's partly that, but the other thing is that um, uh, the massive expansion of um, uh, the derivatives markets, futures yeah. and uh -huh. also the OTC markets and so on, absorbed an awful lot of demand for physical commodities, which effectively suppressed the price. So what you didn't notice so much was the loss of purchasing power of the dollar. You know, right. you'd have, let us say, I mean, if we go back to the, the 90s, inflation might have been running, say, at something like 6%. Mm -hmm. Six or seven percent, but um, uh, you know you didn't really notice this at the commodity side because commodity prices weren't rising, even though there was demand, if you like, and the economy was growing and so on and so forth. It was really the suppression through through um, uh, uh, derivatives, which which really created uh, much of the situation we have today. But of course, that's going into reverse now, and. Um, uh, you know, part of uh, the rise in commodity prices measured in dollar terms, uh, you could attribute that, that I think, to uh, contracting uh, commodities uh, futures and um, OTC markets. That supply begins to unwind. And as that unwinds, obviously, uh, it creates a price rise. Alistair, what would you say to, I mean, there's a Americans and people in, in the West generally, they, they can't fathom the idea that the dollar would not 
remain as a world's reserve currency. I think it's um, one of Adam Taggart's guests, uh, who's on every week, suggested recently that, you know, and, you know this, is, this is not an issue that you should even have to think about. Maybe in 100 or 200 years, long after you're, you and I are gone, Adam, the dollar will cease to be the world's reserve currency. What, what are they missing? Why can't they, you know, why can't our people see, why can't people in the West understand that reserve currencies don't last forever? I mean, it seems so obvious to those of us that have been looking at this for the last 10 years. Well, when you're used to using a currency, um, it's your currency, you're accounting in it and all the rest of it, then you don't actually notice what's going on. And uh, I mean, how many users of dollars in America understand that uh, measured in gold, it has lost 98 percent of its value? No, they don't know. I mean, you know, that's so. So that's the, the background, if, if you were, you, you know, the that's the wonderful dollar. Um, but on top of that, you've you've also got uh, another point, and that is that foreigners are always the first to run scared when things start going wrong. And mm -hmm. this is the importance of the banking system uh, getting into uh, real difficulties. And I think we've only just seen the start of it. As that continues, foreigners are going to sell down dollars. They're going to get out of the dollar. And that will drive down the purchasing power of the dollar further. And meanwhile, um, it would be quite normal for domestic Americans to think that the foreigners were absolutely crazy and the dollar's going to last forever. Right. I mean, if you if you just look at what, you know, every every uh, fiat currency collapse in the past it has always been the domestic holders who have been last to realize what's going on. Mm -hmm. I think the easiest way to describe it is um, uh, there comes a point where people begin to realize that it's not prices going up, but the purchasing power of the currency going down. Now, as soon as they realize that, then the currency's had it. It's toast. Right. Um, so I think what I would say is that um, the people in America who don't actually appreciate what's going on, I can understand entirely why they don't appreciate what's going on. I mean, in Britain, we have people who who would have exactly the same view of Sterling. So, you know, this is not unique to Americans at all. Um, you know, we each believe in our own currencies and we're the last to abandon belief in our own currencies. Psychologically, we don't want to believe our currency is a fraud. I mean, we really don't want to believe it. Yeah. Yes. And and so I can, you know, I can, I can sympathize with, with that view, but yeah. uh, I think it's wrong headed. Well, what will it take then to change that view? Because ultimately, I think there are people that are starting to see it differently already. But well, uh, you have to see a, a hyper infl infl inflation, yeah. in which your your dollar buys less and less, and people start just trying to find a way to defend their their wealth, and mm. and the markets just dictate them to to come to believe what the reality is. I think the people who are talking about hyperinflation or whatever are very much a minority. I mean, even in uh, the gold market, most of the people trading in gold, they're looking at it as an investment, not as an escape from a collapsing fiat system. Yeah. They, they, you know, they think that, um, you know, they can buy gold today, uh, which is currently just over $2,000, and they might be expecting it to run up to, say, 2600 or something <laughs> like that. You know, they're wildly bullish. I mean, this is actually bearish because they're looking at it upside down. Gold is legal money. The dollar is just credit. It's a currency in credit. And it's that that's going down. I mean, let's let's put it another way. Um, if I was to tell you that uh, there would be at some stage in the future, and I'm not going to put a time limit on this at all or anything silly like that, that uh, there will that that the price of gold in dollars will go to a hundred thousand, hundred thousand dollars for an ounce of gold, you would think McLeod's lost his his marbles. He's been completely nonsensical. If, on the other hand, I told you that. The dollar is going to lose its purchasing power to the point where there will be a hundred thousand to the ounce of gold. Right. Then that begins to make a bit more sense. Right. <laughs> you see what I mean? This is the this is the important thing. Right. To think to think that it, we're in a bull market for gold is absolutely wrong. We're right. not. Right. We're in a bear market for the dollar, and that is the point that I think domestic 
residents and users of the dollar in America, they will be the last actually to really realize that. The foreigners will begin to suspect it and realize it first. And that's what we're seeing. I mean, as to your point about people sort of getting out of the dollar, getting into another currency, this is basically what they're saying to themselves. Well, you talked about the Mississippi bubble on the, on my show in the past, and uh, you know people that ended up with the, with the currency, uh, or they could have invested it. They might have had a, a high number, but the currency was worth nothing. The, the stock might have been worth a lot, but the investment, you know, because it was denominated in uh, yeah. in, in the currency. So, I mean, so what if you have if, if gold is a hundred thousand dollars? If the currency buys nothing, it doesn't mean anything. So, um, exactly. Uh, so, um, Alistair, one of the things you mentioned, you thought that Putin's goal was in, in you know, really was to get uh, get the United States out of Europe. And here's uh, Macron running off to to Beijing and making these these statements that must be shocking that NATO alliance and, uh, you, you know, about we need to detach ourselves or we, I give you exact words, but to be less close or less dependent on the United States or something like that. Yeah. Um, do you think this is a crack in the in in, the, in a, a crack in the infrastructure of the European or the NATO alliance? Possibly. I mean, I thought it might be Germany first because of what Putin was doing, and uh, you know they might have frozen to death this winter. It was a mild winter, I guess, compared to some. But somehow the Germans were able to sort of survive the thing. All right. Uh, but ultimately, countries have to do what's in their best interest. I mean, propaganda can only go so far, I think. And then ultimately, it's just like the dollar propaganda. Uh, ultimately, when the dollar buys nothing, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't work anymore. Truth, truth ultimately re is revealed, right? Yeah, I think, yes. Uh, um, <laughs> I mean, it's driving a wedge, if you like, um, yeah. between Europe and America. I have no doubt that uh, both the Chinese and the Russians um, see this beginning to happen um but on its own it will take a very long time i think for that wedge really to be driven in your point about germany is absolutely right um but i feel i mean i'm going over to germany actually next month so i might get a slightly better feel for it but uh the impression i get is that the german businessmen um are looking at the situation with quite a lot of horror really um they understand the uh, you know what's going on. They understand the that that the, 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 the Americans blew up the Nord Stream pipeline. Um, they understand. I mean, you've had sort of continual problems in the past, like you know the the, the CIA exposed as spying on um, right. you know on 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 the president and the chancellor of, of of Germany, which was the case under Angela Merkel. She was spied on, you know, and this was a story. I think, you know, but the problem is that, you know, having been on the wrong end of two world wars, Germany basically is just sat upon. It It is not allowed to have an opinion. It doesn't even allow itself to have any opinion. Mm -hmm. Its politics are completely anodyne. Um, it's it's a very difficult situation, I think, for German business. And Volkswagen, for example, had three factories in Russia which um, it was forced to try and sell. Um, it has failed to sell it. And as I understand it, there is a court case against them um, whereby they may well lose possession of it. I mean, because one of the things that I'm afraid isn't really uh, respected very much in Asia are property rights. Um, yeah. you know, we've seen this, we've seen this with, in, in the past with, yeah. with uh, various actions by indeed President Putin. Uh, and we see this with um, Chinese businessmen disappearing. Mm -hmm. you know? I yeah. mean, literally disappearing. Yeah. So um, this is this is something. Getting back to Europe, I think, I think there is a sort of quiet undercurrent of leaders who do actually um, think that the whole um, you know sort of NATO thing is just uh, destructive for European prospects, mm -hmm. and uh, but they're tolerating it. They're, they're tolerating it. They feel they've got no alternative. But it's going to be interesting because as all these other countries get out of the American sphere right. of influence, right. um, you know, I think I think that pressure is going to build on on the European leaders. So I think it's something you certainly need to be watched. But I wouldn't I wouldn't put money on anything happening very, very quickly. Right. 
Well, certainly the European countries will be trading with some of those other countries that are doing business, you know, outside of the dollar. So, it, yeah, it's going to be interesting to watch, that's for sure. Um, well, anyway, so where does India stand in this whole thing? I mean, they are the eye and the bricks. Are, are they Are they really, um, I mean, they're, they're not all that keen on the dollar either. They're the most populous country in the world now. Yeah. Uh, no, you're, you're right. And um, not only are they the eye and the bricks, but also they're members of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Um, you know, they're rarely in there, uh, despite having border skirmishes with China in Tibet. <laughs> you know, they're in partnership with them. So, um, you know, I, and they're, they're building coal-fired power stations, sure. um, you know, looting the planet and in their own way. Um <laughs> And uh, uh, for a long time, they have been actually an ally of of Russia. I mean, under under the, the uh, Gandhis, this was, you know, who was socialist basically. Um, you had that. You had that that relationship with Russia, and so India has always had armaments supplied by Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, and I make this point, uh, you know, because you made the point about Saudi Arabia, which is very much a customer of our ar arms trade. Yes. Um, you know, so I think I think that um, India's I mean, it, it's really growing very rapidly as an economy. And I think that's going to continue. And of course, as that wealth develops, um, there is going to be an element of demand for gold and silver, which will be build up on the back of it. Uh, and um, but against that, there is a new, um, if you like, entrepreneurial class of young Indian who um, is is turning his back, if you like, on on uh, the traditions of India to a large extent, including precious metals. So, I think as as far as precious metals are concerned, it is a positive story, um, but it's probably not um, as positive as some of the bulls would think. Uh, but no, India, I think, has got an awful lot of potential, and of course, tying in with um, China and the improved communications and the industrial revolution, which is planned through the whole of Asia, mm -hmm. uh, is, you know, it, it really has no alternative but to get into that uh, sphere of influence. Right. Doesn't seem as though uh, the Asians are all that, uh, they might give lip service to climate change, but they don't seem to be, <laughs> they don't seem to be building a lot of windmills and other things, I guess. But uh, no, they, no, I mean, uh, you know, if 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 they want us to build, if if, if we want them to build windmills, they will do it <laughs> for export. Yeah, but, for export. Uh, you know, but yeah, but I mean, you know, they always make the point that it's all very well for the wealthy West to turn around and deny everybody um you know cheap fuel and all the rest right. of it right but um you know we are in a position to do so why should we disadvantage everybody else who needs cheap energy that's their view and i think it's perfectly understandable yeah well um you, you mentioned property rights and we had gold confiscated once in america i uh, uh there's uh, frank holmes was on my show last week and he was suggesting that could be a possibility uh, in the future, uh, what, what are your thoughts? Um, it's certainly possible. Um, I mean, we know how stupid politicians can be. <laughs> well, that's actually not entirely fair. They're driven by a completely different agenda, which um, uh, is a nonsense agenda. They have to rather go along with it. But it's a, uh, an interesting question. I mean, I don't know to what extent American citizens um, surrendered their gold in 1933. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I was sort of asking the question of someone I've known for a long time who's been dealing in gold sovereigns in, in this country, because in the late 70s, we were banned from owning gold sovereigns. I think we were limited to four sovereigns or something. Uh -huh. And uh, <laughs> did anyone submit their sovereigns? Well, his answer was that they went bid only. <laughs> <laughs> in other words, there were no sellers. So, yeah. you know, uh, so we all just hoard it is, is the short answer. I don't think it achieves anything. And I think it probably on balance drives up the price if they try and do it. Yeah. Well, I don't so know get how it before, yeah. before you can't, I think yeah. is probably the message. Yeah, sit by it before you can't. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't know to what extent Americans still own gold. They certainly understood it better in the 1930s than they do now. They understood that gold was money. Our generations yeah. and youngers, 
you know, they're going into, into the cryptos, right? The Bitcoin and so forth, think it's the equivalent of, and I know we don't have time to talk about that today. You've talked about it in the past. So I guess maybe in summing up here, Alistair, you're telling us that gold is not in a bull market. <laughs> if you measure it um, by the underlying currency creation, it is not in a bull market by any means. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's not overpriced is what you're saying. And it probably yeah. makes a lot of sense to buy it while you can is what you just said, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's not that gold is in a bull market. It is yeah. that the dollar is in a bear, market. a bear market. That is the key point. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, there will come a point, Jay, where um, its scarcity of gold will drive up its value measured in goods and services. Right. Um, and you'll be, you know, you'll be able to buy, um, you know, flash cars or yachts or houses with very little gold because it will be so scarce. But that is not the initial effect. The initial effect is falling purchasing power of paper currencies, fiat currencies, making gold look good. But it's actually them looking very, very bad. Well, we'll uh, I guess we'll we'll be able to buy yachts and mansions if they allow us to keep our gold. And that's uh, the topic we just who knows how that's going to be. But Frank uh, made the uh, obviously Frank's talking his book to a certain extent, but made also the observation in the 1930s when Americans couldn't buy gold or weren't allowed to own it. They turned around and took the proceeds and bought homestake mining and some of the gold miners. So that mm -hmm. was their way of uh, buying gold in the ground. And uh, of course, that's what the show uh, all, we have our sponsors or producers or explorationists of gold and silver some remarkable stories are uh, are developing globally there i know alistair that's not something that you follow and i would say that people want to own the real stuff the real thing first not the derivatives which of course mining is kind of a derivative of of gold and silver too if it's in the ground you don't have it in your possession and it might cost an awful lot to get it out so it's the economics of getting it out that really yeah. matters uh, from it. It's a business. It's not a store of wealth as owning gold and silver in your own vault. Yeah. That's really what we want to do. Alistair, I want to thank you so much again for spending time with us. Your insights are so valuable to our listeners, to our viewers these days. I keep saying listeners because we used to be a radio show. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, great to have you again. That's very much my pleasure, Jay. Thank you for having me on. You bet. All right, folks, well, that is it for this week. Next week, I'm going to have Mark Thornton. He's an Austrian economist who studied under Murray Rothbard. He'll be my guest next week and perhaps a mining company as well. Until then, goodbye and God's blessings to you. Mm -hmm.